Come on. How you guys doing this morning? You good? You awake? Guys, I got to be honest with you. I'm a little sad. Uh, I was just, um, just real briefly, I, uh, I looked on my phone to see, yes, I looked on my phone in church. I apologize. To see uh, the update of the World Cup. It was the final today. And uh, my, uh, my homeland, Croatia, was playing. And I just found out they lost 4-2 to two to France. So um, pray for me that I can get through this okay. So I am a little sad. But man, how, how, can we just honor your pastors, Pastors Lynn and Renee? Aren't they amazing? Come on, you can do better than that. Let's honor these guys. Hey, I love you guys so much, and it, and it is, it, it, it really is true. I was telling my wife, I don't know of a couple that's more awesome than you guys, and I, I totally take you guys in as, as my, uh, my parents, and, and I just love and appreciate you guys, all that you've done for us, and how you've just believed in the gift of God that's on our lives, and, and just so, so appreciate you. Praise God. I need that. We can bring it over here. Let me help you. Guys, how awesome is Christy's worship? Don't you guys love her? I'll tell you about it in a second. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, man. Um, hey, I think I got a video I wanted to show you guys kind of before I started. Talia, is it good? In 2011, a major revelatory shift took place. Into my living room walk these YWAM wild men and they begin to prophesy there's coming a shift to the call and it will not just be fasting and prayer but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled and Billy Graham's mantles coming on the nation. And then they said the call is going to lead to the send and it struck me maybe the call is a forerunner for a new Jesus movement coming. It put me in shock and I knew it had a time period to look to the place and time when Billy Graham would die. At that moment, a massive shift's coming and it will not just be John the Baptist, it will be Jesus the Evangelist is gonna fill stadiums in America. From that moment on, a dream exploded in my spirit. That if I saw stadiums filled with young people fasting and praying, why wouldn't I believe that I would see stadiums filled with massive evangelism, signs and wonders and miracles and hundreds of thousands of people being saved in America? If I saw the first fulfillment, why couldn't I believe for the second fulfillment? And so what we see is that there are these moments in history where the power of God is present to do something extraordinary. There's an opportunity. There is an open door. And what happens is, is that if that generation will step through that open door by faith and take action, they can literally see history change. And I'm praying that a few people, man, even if it's one, that somebody's going to be like, look, I'm going to pay whatever price I have to pay to get a breakthrough in the glory of God get a breakthrough for a whole nation. So we are calling for 60,000 believers to gather from the nation and the nations of the earth to believe that the SEND would be a catalytic gathering to a new era of global missions and evangelism across America. Something will transfer and bring us into, I believe, worldwide transition into the greatest Jesus movement we have ever seen. Come on. Come on. I get stirred every time I see that video. I know, um, Talia, can you just pull up the slide? I know I'm just asking there. Perfect. No, it's there. 
Just even that last slide that's on this TV right here would be awesome. So February 23rd, something uh, I'm a part of and I'm, I'm helping kind of push out right now is a, a thing called The Send, which is what this video is about. And we are believing that a new era of evangelism needs to sweep the church. What we're believing, I, I, we get struck by the Jesus People movement. And I was, you know, talking with some friends the other day how they would go on the streets and they would just say, you need to give your life to Jesus and people get saved right there. And then I think of guys like Billy Graham, who was just, would preach the, such a pure message, such a pure gospel, and, and millions came to Christ in America. And I'm believing if just one, if every believer would just reach one, if every believer we just commit saying, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to reach one. I'm going to reach my neighbor. I'm going to reach the local high school. I'm going to reach the university. You know what? I feel like God's calling me to go to the nations long term. But for a lot of us, we're like, man, that's awesome. I want to go do it. But how do I do it? So we're going to be using, we're building some platforms and we're, we're working on training to actually equip the body of Christ. So not only you would just come and, and get stirred for your city, get stirred for your church, get stirred for high schools and universities and the nations, but that you would actually get tools on how to do it. And so we're calling America to the stadium, to the Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida on February 23rd. What I believe could be a historic moment for America. And if you're like me at all, you're believing for a turn of the tide in America. And the only way, the only way that I believe that this could happen is the gospel. And we have, as believers, a missional and evangelistic calling. If you don't think that's true, read your Bible. Matthew 28, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. He gives a great commission. Go. I always love saying this. Try to spell gospel without go. It's in the DNA of the gospel. It's in the DNA of the message of Jesus that we were always created to go. We were always created to preach the gospel. He said in John 14, I believe it was, greater things than these will you do. When are we going to start tapping into the greater things? I hear stories of John G. Lake and A.A. A. Allen and F.F. F. Bosworth and Billy Graham and Reinhard Bonnke and, and some of these great men of faith and what they pressed into God, seeing souls saved, seeing bodies healed, seeing people delivered. I'm like, I want that for myself. I'm tired of hearing the stories. I'm tired of reading about it in the book. I'm tired of seeing it in the Bible. I want it for myself. And I believe, I thoroughly believe this is what's going to change our nation. This is what's going to change our nation. Is if we would get over ourselves, we'd get over our fear, man, and we just say, you know what? He's worth it. He's worth my life. He's worth me giving everything for him. I don't no longer, I no longer want to live an inactive faith. So we're saying, the sin, February 23rd, let's wage war on inaction. Let's wage war on passive Christianity. Let's wage war. Say, it's time for a new Jesus people movement. It's time for a new Jesus people movement. And so we're calling you, Valley Church. Would you come and would you join us February 23rd at the stadium, the Camping World Stadium, where we believe God is going to do something that would lead to a shift in America. And I believe every nation would be touched with the gospel. And no longer would it be said that there's 1,600 languages that have yet to be, have a portion of the Bible translated. That it would yet to be said that there's still 9,000 unreached people groups in the world. Could we believe for a shift in our nation and the nations of the world? So we're calling you there. You can sign up on the send.org. Again, February 23rd. And uh, I'm really excited. I really believe God's going to do something in your life. He's going to do something in your neighborhood's life. He's going to do something in the universities in, in Idaho. He wants to do stuff in the high schools in Idaho. Come on, would you be a part of it? Would you be a part of this? We want to see you guys there. Um, you know, it's been a year since I've been with you guys. I was here last year, honestly, at the same time. And it's so funny that I get to preach on this day again. Uh, six years ago, on today, it's actually one of my best friend's birthday, Jonah, who was just here speaking at the camp with me. And on that day, he drug me to a church. And uh, I was just recently saved. 
I had no idea about the Holy Spirit, didn't have any idea that I could pray for the sick and they'd recover, that when I preached the gospel that the anointing of God would come on me and people would get saved. I had no idea about any of that. And it was, it was uh, six years ago, not seven years, six years ago today, I found myself in a church in Gig Harbor, Washington, and I got delivered of a whole lot of stuff in my life, and I got filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And from that point, everything changed for me. From that point, everything changed. So like, this is my Pentecost Sunday. I, and, and I'm believing, I believe that God has something for you. I, I'm here to challenge you this morning. I don't believe that we're called to go to church and just have a feel-good message and, and feel really good about ourselves and, you know, then wait, you know, have a really hard week and then come back on Sunday, get that really encouraging word again, and then, ooh, I'll make, I'll make it through the week. Man, work's really hard. My marriage sucks. My kids might have demons in them. But, man, if I just go to church that Sunday, man, I'll get that encouragement to get, to get me through the week. That's not what church is about. Church is about getting you equipped and empowered to go bring the gospel and, and change atmospheres in your workplace. Church is all about getting activated to go and see workplaces transformed by the gospel. This is not the only place for Jesus. I was, I was thinking about this, the, uh, Ezekiel's river found in, in the book of Ezekiel. And it, I found this so inter interesting. As it went farther, as the river went farther from the temple, farther from the place that God was, the river got deeper. So why is it the further away you get from the house of God, the river gets deeper? Because he's always, he was always meant to break out at your workplace. He was always meant to break out in government and in the White House. It was always meant that he would break out when you're at Walmart and you're getting groceries you're at Albertsons. You're at the bank. It was always meant the further we get away from the church, the deeper his river goes. But I'm going to be honest, I haven't seen that. And so I'm here today. I just want to challenge you. Is that okay? Can, can, we, can, can I have that place? Can we have a little bit of a conversation? Can, can, we, can we just say, hey, we're not here on a normal Sunday just to do church and get an encouraging word? I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how new you are. We were always created to go and preach the gospel. Amen? Well, lots happened in my life over the last year. Um, last, so last year when I was here, I was three weeks away, um, about three weeks away from getting married. And uh, can you throw that picture up? No? That's okay. There it is. That works. That's my beautiful wife, Rachel. That's that half-decent man. That's me. You know, a lot of people tell us that we're a power couple, and I tell them, I said, well, she brings the power, and I just make it a couple. But, man, she is beautiful. She has made me absolutely more like Jesus. She loves God way more than I do. Um, she's praying for you guys right now. We are on the phone uh, just before um, I kind of came into the church, and, you know, she gives me this whole download, and I'm like, what in the world? I must not be hearing God. So, so anything you hear good today, it was probably because of Rachel's prayers. So um, she so wishes that she could be here with you guys. Um, we're hopefully going to get her out here soon, uh, and, uh, and you guys can meet her. You'll love her. So can we get into some Bible this morning? Yeah. How many of you guys love the Bible? Yeah. I told all the kids, I told them I was going to give them all an individual prophetic word this week when we were at camp. You know what that prophetic word was? Read your Bible. I went down the line. I said, I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to prophesy the word that's going to change your life. Like this is the word. This is the download from God right here, right now. Like he just whispered it in my ear. You ready for it? You're like, yeah, give it to me. I'm ready to be changed. Read your Bible. They're like, wait a minute, what? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. I'm telling you, if there was, a, there was one prophetic word I could live giving every day, every moment, every second, every church, every ministry, is read your Bible. This is the book that transforms nations. This is the book that changed my life, that convicted me of my sin, 
that as I was thinking today in, in Colossians 2, there's a verse that says that we are being renewed in the knowledge of our Creator. But if you have no knowledge of your Creator, how are you ever going to look like Him? If you're not beholding Him, how can you become like Him? Well, I behold Him in the secret place. Well, how do you know if it's really Him if you don't have any Bible in you? We got to know the Word. We got to know truth because it's truth that sets you free. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Okay, you got your Bible, right? Okay, go with me to Philippians 2, verse 1 through 8. It's going to be up here on the Mega Bible. I'm going to read it from here. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion that make my joy complete, Paul speaking, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing, say nothing, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, do you guys know when, when you see the word rather in a comma, you should probably pay attention to what's about to be said? You guys know that? Where's Bible study tip 101? When you see rather, it's like, whoa, okay, time to pay attention here. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What was that mindset? Who being, verse 6 here, who being in very nature God... Jesus, fully God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, there it is again, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death a cross. So this is going to be the scripture we're going to go after today, but hey man, can we just pray real quick? I just was, as we were sitting over here in worship, I kept uh, hearing the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I was just so reminded of the faithfulness of Jesus. How there's nothing that I've ever done to earn His faithfulness. There's nothing that I've ever done to gain that type of, of love and of grace and of mercy. And so I was singing, great is thy faithfulness. And I began to make this declaration, Lord, let it be said that great is my faithfulness to you. So can we just pray? Every eye closed. Holy Spirit, would you come today? Lord, I don't want to preach a good message. God, I, I don't want to just do church as, as usual. God, I want to be changed. I want to be transformed. I want to be renewed in the knowledge of you. God, I want to, I want to know why the, the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. I want to know why the elders cast their feet at your crown, at your feet, God. Lord, I want to know you. So Jesus, I pray you use me as a vessel. I pray every heart would be softened to the reality of the gospel. Lord, and we just want to look more like you at the end of, the, end of today. That's all I ask, Lord. We want to look like you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, can you guys give it up for Jared? Isn't he awesome? You're good, bro. Tickling the, tickling the ivories. Man, if we had anything good at camp, it was probably because of Jared. You don't have to play keys anymore. Appreciate it. Man. I am so excited to be here, man. I, I, I honestly, um, we, my wife and I, we've been on the road for the last five weeks, and, and it's been like every week we're kind of like in a new place, new bed, sleeping on the floor somewhere, like, oh my gosh, Jesus, you're so worth it. In our first year of marriage, I, I, I don't know who I was talking to someone up here, it's like how, I, I just like began to think of our first year of marriage, and I'm just like, what are we doing? Like, I'm like telling like my mom what we're doing, telling my dad, and they're like, you guys are nuts. Like your first year of marriage, you're like traveling almost every week, going to new places, sleeping on floors, 
going into places you're like, well, I was just in Florida a couple weeks ago, and I remember two days before I got to the city that I was going to be in, in Jacksonville, someone asked me, like, do you know where you're staying? I'm like, nope, not yet. One day before, hey, do you know where you're staying? No, I don't know yet. A couple hours, I'm on my way to Jacksonville. Do you know where you're staying? <laughs> Maybe somewhere tonight. Maybe in the car. I don't know. And then God provides. It's just like, man, how fun is it that we get to follow Jesus? How fun is it that we get to lay our lives down for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And he actually gives us the opportunity to serve him. And he, he gives us, we're like, well, how do I serve? Well, he gives us the greatest example. He lays down his own life. Like no greater love is this than one who would lay down his life for his friend. Like he gives us the greatest example of what it means to live a life of love. But how many of you would say you flip on the local news and we're not seeing a culture of love? Rather, maybe a culture of hate. And I don't care what side of the political spectrum you swing on, there is a, there is a culture of hate. I don't care, you know, what, what you, you know, even in religion, there's a culture of hate. Even within our own family, there's a culture of hate. And so I believe that we are on the brink of a love revolution. And we need, we would all say, I need, we need a love revolution, right? We got to define what a revolution is. This is Webster's Dictionary. It says a revolution is a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. It doesn't say a passive overthrow. Like, like I'm over here, like I'm just like passively like, I guess we'll overthrow it. Like, huh. Like, no, it says a forcible overthrow of a government. A forcible overthrow of an old system. So we cannot take our love lightly. If we want a real love revolution, if we want to see the old system of hate overthrown, we need to be forcible in our love. We need to be forcible in the way that we serve. We need to be forcible in the way that we would humble ourselves. So I think so often we think Christianity is about me. Christianity is about, well, this is a self-serving gospel. Like, I want to be blessed. I want, I want God's gifts. I want God's anointing. I want his hands. I want the things that he does. But how many of you guys know, I have a, a Todd White says this. He says, if you were saved for yourself, then the moment of salvation, you just would have swept up into heaven. Why are you still here? Because you were never saved for yourself. You were loved so that you could become loved. You were served so that you could serve. You were blessed so that you could be a blessing. Right? But if we want to have a forcible overthrow of this old system of hate, and we want to establish a new system of love, we need to know how Jesus did that being the example. Like if we are called to be like him, we need to know what he did, right? So let's go back to our, to our scripture here. It says, talking about Jesus... Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I often think of this, of like, in one moment, Jesus could have like split the heavens and been like, I'm here now to save humanity. Look to me. Love me. Love me. Like he's almighty God, right? So he would have had the power to do that. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he split the heavens, snap his finger, and all of us were in alignment following Jesus? Why? He didn't count being in very nature God something to be used to his own advantage. It says rather, there's that rather word again, he made himself nothing by taking on the nature of a servant. So you mean he didn't like walk up in the room and be like, serve me. No, he came and he said, let me serve you. What's love? Love is not something that's forced you go to prison for something like that. If you try to force love on someone, you better believe you're going to prison and you won't have a nice time in prison. Yeah. 
We got to learn what it means to serve because love looks like something. We got to humble ourselves. And it says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. I get blown away by this. God, like everything was perfect in heaven until he made us. You know, like, like you got to think it was perfect in heaven. Like they lacked nothing. It was like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It was just fun time. They were like probably telling perfect humor jokes to one another. Like I think they were kind of like me and my buddy Jonah. Like when him and I get together, it is like we just try to see who can make each other laugh the, the hardest. But it's just like our competition. And I think even perfect joy they had, perfect love, perfect union, they didn't need anything. But what was the most selfless thing they could have done? We, need to, we want to share this love. So let's make humanity. How many of you guys think, man, Jesus, you know, they're up there, they start forming Adam and Eve, and then that little serpent comes in, and they make the bad decisions. Sin enters the world. They're like, oh, crap. What do we do? What do we do? Oh, no. What did we do? We just wanted to serve them. We just wanted to love them, but they gave them a choice. I just think like he put on flesh to save us. He put on flesh to restore us back to the garden. He put on flesh he didn't have to. Again, for our redemption, all he needed to do was snap his finger. One moment you would have been redeemed. He wanted to give us an example. So he puts on flesh never ever to take it off again. Think about this. One million, trillion, kabillion, I don't even know what else there is. Years from now, you will be able to look at the man Jesus and there will be wounds in his hands. You better believe you lift up his shirt and there is a wound in his side. I'm sure you'd be able to still see the scars from his crown of thorns. He didn't want to force his love on us because that's not what real love is. Love serves. Love humbles itself. Love says, not what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? You see, I think we've got it wrong. I think for so long we've looked at love and saying, love is the way that, that I get from people. And, and, and love is self-seeking. And love is prideful. And love says, look at me. But when we look at 1 Corinthians, that's not what love is. We need to overthrow the old system. And it's become this culture where we think it's okay to tear each other down for the sake of love. You see it a lot in the millennial culture. Hey, look at that shirt. That's ugly. Or there's this joke around when someone's wearing some funny shoes. You say, what are those? And they're making fun of the way they're dressed. Why do we think the suicide rates are so high? Because we don't have a right revelation of what love looks like. We got to redefine love. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Is it up there? It'll be there in a sec. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Hello. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Can I tell you guys a story? So I work for a ministry. It's called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Uh, one of the largest missions organizations in the world, pioneered in the 60s by a guy named Lauren Cunningham. And... Um, I did this thing called a DTS. It's a six-month program. Talia, who's up there, Jordan. Where are you, Jordan? Jordan did it. A few other friends. And, um, 
and Julie. Julie was my neighbor. We were literally next door neighbors, but now she's moved here. Miss you. Um, I'll miss having your kids' clothes in my closet when you're trying to teach them a lesson. That's a funny story. One time Julie com comes over to my house, probably like 10, 30, 11 at night, knocks on my door, and I'm, I'm like, what is going on right now? Am I being too loud? Like, I'm nervous. And uh, I open the door, and it's Julie with like a bag of, uh, like a, a garbage bag. And I'm like, hey, Julie, good to see you. And she's like, hey, can, can you be my village? Like, like what Lynn was talking about, like it takes a village to raise kids. And she says, hey, uh, the kids are, you know, I'm trying to teach her a lesson. I told her to clean up her room, but she didn't. So I picked up all her clothes, and I told her I'm going to throw it all away. I'm not actually going to throw it away. Can I hide it in your, uh, in your closet for a few days? <laughs> I'm like, Julie, come right in. Put your clothes in my closet. This is your village. So that's a fun story about Julie. But I'm doing, I'm doing my DTS, and it's like, it's like a six-month revival program, okay? So you're like, you're like every day, you're getting incredible speakers. You're getting the Todd Whites, getting Francis Chan, getting all these like epic revivalists coming in telling us how to be revivalists. So I go uh, three months for doing all this training. Three months, I go on my outreach. And I, we saw crazy miracles. We saw the, the blind were seeing, the lame were walking, the deaf were hearing. I mean, it was, it was incredible. So many people saved and, and delivered. And uh, I come home. And uh, let's just say I had a little pride in me. Can, can I be transparent with you this morning? Is that okay? Is that okay we be transparent in church? I had a little bit of pride in me. And... Uh, because I was told that I'm a revivalist, you better believe I was coming home as a revivalist. And I remember being on the plane as I'm flying, you know, 35,000 feet in the air. I'm just there rocking back and forth. I'm like, Tacoma has no idea what's about to hit them. I'm like, I'm like, you better believe Mr. Revival Man is when he touched the soil, you already know everybody's slain in the spirit. Like when revival man hits the ground, you bet, oh, you lame? Get up and walk in Jesus' name. I'm revival man. <laughs> and I remember like walking into my home church. This didn't happen like this way, but this is how I felt it was. It was like walking into church one day. Like I'm like, my church has no idea what they've been doing. Like they're not revivalist. I'm a revivalist. I'm Mr. Revival Man. Todd White told me I'm revival man. I remember, like, we got, you know, those double French doors. I walk in there, I'm like, <laughs> Revival man is here. I'm about to bring the revival. You already know. It was like, how many of you guys have ever seen Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? The Chronicles of Narnia? I felt like Lucy coming out of the wardrobe. It was like, Poof. You have no idea what I just saw out there. Come into my reality as revival man. No love, no serving. I was like, you need to give me the microphone, Mr. Pastor of 20 years, Mr. Pastor. You don't even know what I've been through. I've been studying the word for six months. I got the revelation. Like, you know John's revelation? Yeah, I got a 2.0 of that. Visitation status. Give me the microphone, Mr. Pastor. How many of you guys know that probably didn't work very well for Mr. Revival Man? You see, but part of us, that's the culture. As we go, I, I remember I used to do this. I would like go down the streets as Mr. Revival Man. I would talk to the lost as Mr. Revival Man. I'd be like rolling down like Pacific Avenue in Tacoma, Washington. Like Revival Man, you, where the knowledge just came. Come closer. I have a word of the Lord for you. I'm a prophet. Do you not know I'm a prophet? Honor me. Kiss my feet. Honor me. Look at me. Don't look at me. Kiss my feet. Because you know when revival man walks on the scene, you better believe revival's about to break out. And then this guy comes up to me. He's totally lost, like doesn't know Jesus at all, never stepped foot in a church, never wrote the Bible. And I'm like, I'm going to put my hand on your head. And I'm like rocking him back and forth like you're going to be slain in the spirit. And he's like, what are you doing? Stop telling me. He's ready to like swing on me. Like you don't do this where I'm from. You're going to get swung on. Like that's not okay. But no, I'm Mr. Revival Man. I'm a prophet. I am the lead intercessor. I've been praying for you. My prayers will change you. 
And I'm like, I'm like, I'm just like praying in tongues, like on the street. Like, how is that love? Sometimes we need to get out of revival man skin and just put on normal skin like Jesus did. Come on, the Bible says that he humbled himself like a man. Why are you trying to be something else? Be a man, be a woman. Get to know someone. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but don't have I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Let's say you walk up into church one day and you like, I got the word of the Lord. And you're down there, you're, you're at the altar and you're praying for that person and you're just giving them the word of the Lord. Pop, 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 pop. And that person's like, that's not wrong. You're like calling out all their sin. You're telling them how awful of a person they are. Like you're like, God told me all this stuff. I don't care. Like if you get the like gift of tongues in the middle of a service, but if you are not saturated in love, I don't care how gifted of a preacher you are. I don't care how gifted of evangelist you are. I don't care if you are the lead intercessor. If you don't, if you don't have love, this is all I hear. If we want a love revolution, we need to humble ourselves and learn how to serve. Well, man, you don't understand. My wife just gets on my nerves. Humble yourself, man. Learn how to serve her. Because maybe it's not her. Maybe your perspective is wrong. But when you learn how to serve, you learn how to love, it begins to change your perspective. Love changes your perspective. Love makes you look at things a little different. Love, you know, I hate my job. Nine to five, I'm in a cubicle, or I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I hate my job. What if you just learned how to serve your boss? And one day, you find out you're getting all these raises, you're getting all this, like, blessing and promotion. One day, your boss goes up to you and says, why are you so different? Not because the first day you get baptized, filled in the Holy Spirit, you walk up into work and you just go, Revival man's here. <laughs> Mr. Boss, I'm blessed. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I used to be depressed, but now I'm blessed. You need to give me a raise. <laughs> How many of you know you walk up in like that, you're not getting no raise? <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Have you tried it? <laughs> Someone's like, dang it, totally did that. <laughs> I'm still mopping the floors. <laughs> I, dang it. But what if you go into your workplace and you just begin to serve like crazy? No matter how hard, no matter how your, your, your uh, boss may treat you, no matter how hard school might be, your university, your, your home life, if you just went in, because do you think Jesus was understood? Like, do you think out of anyone that has ever walked the earth, he had the right to be offended? He had the right to say something to the, the ones that were just about to crucify him. He had every right. He could have said, I'm sinless. All I've done is love. All I've done is heal. All I've done is care for the poor. And you're killing me. You're giving me the death that I tell you I don't deserve. But what does the Bible say? He was silent. Like a sheep before the shears. So was he before his persecutors. What if you just got over yourself, you laid down your pride a little bit, and you just began to serve? What does that say about your Jesus? I was reading something today, Maha Gandhi. He said, to talking about Christians, I love your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. They're nothing like your Christ. Just let it settle in. Let it settle in. What if we just begin to serve like crazy? What if, I, what if we began to go into my work and the first thing you said to your boss, what can I do for you today? You went home to your wife who's been nagging at you all week. What if you just finally took out the trash? <laughs> what if you finally just picked up your underwear? <laughs> Guys, I'm only saying that I'm in the first year of marriage. I'm having to do it, okay? I'm learning it. <laughs> my biggest thing that, that Rachel, my wife, she gets on me about is, is when I get out of the shower, I literally instantly just put my towel on the bed. 
And she, ha- oh my gosh. Ooh, Lord, she hates it. She, it's like her biggest pet peeve is when that towel goes on the bed. She's like, mm, 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 I love you, but mm, mm. And then I'm getting all irritated because I'd be like, man, you're just nagging at me all the time. But what if I just surfed her and picked up my towel and put it away? All, all the ladies, all the wives are like, hallelujah. Speak to my husband. Hey, ladies, don't make me go there, but I will. There's that one sister in the church you just can't stand. Can't, maybe it's the way she worships. Maybe it's how she always is complaining, has problems. And you go around, you get your little sister's club, and you'll just start complaining. What if you just begin to bless her? What if you just begin to go up to her, and you just begin to serve her like crazy? And you said, hey, sister, what can I do for you? How can I bless you? How can I serve you? Are you in need today? Like, what can I do? I just want to bless you. What does that say about your Jesus? Man, it's one of the most notorious things, and I feel like we don't have commercials about it anymore, but there's always the, you know, the old lady with the walker with her groceries crossing the street, groceries fall, and like, who's going to be there to help her and pick it up? What does that say about your Jesus when you just think, oh man, someone else will do it? We got to break passivity off the church because it's hindering us from looking like Jesus. Ah, oh, just wait. Someone else will get it. Someone else will do the love thing. Someone else will serve. Someone else will bless. No! You want to be revival, man? Learn how to serve. You want to learn how to be revival intercessor, revival prophet? Learn how to serve. Man, what if we begin to go to our pastors and say, hey, whatever I can do, I just want to serve you. I don't care about the mic. Like, you need me to greet at doors? I'll greet at doors. What's the need today? I'll meet it. What does that say about our Jesus? This is the love revolution. Because what's going to end suicide? Love. What's going to end divorce rates? Come on, let this set in this morning. I want to activate you, Valley Church, into being radical servants that are full of love. Like, what does this community need? How do, we, how do we bless the community? I don't want to just be known as like, that's the house of worshipers. I want to be known like, man, Valley Church serves their community like with everything they have. They never stop blessing. They never stop giving. Whenever there's a need in the community, they're just pouring out their finances like it's nothing. Where are we in the time of crisis? We got to put on love. It's the bond of perfection, Colossians says. Jared, you can come up here, band. You can come up here. I'm kind of wrapping up. Where are we going to see racism abolished? I don't care what you believe about racism. It's real. There's hurt people. Whether you think that there's racism going on or not, whether there's unfair treatment, whatever, people are hurt. How do we change that? We love and we serve. I'm going to get real bold. You need to take your opinion, and you need to just, sh- you, need, you need to throw it away. I'm going to say some choice words. I get passionate about this. We got to learn how to su- serve. We got to learn how to love. Because that's the only thing that's going to abolish racism. Police brutality, how does that end? Love, serving. How do, how do we end I come from a family of divorce. I love my parents dearly. But do I believe divorce was the design of God? Absolutely not. How do we end that? We learn how to serve. We learn how to pick up our cross every day. I gotta lay down my rights. Some of us, man, we're living in a fence and it's hindering you from being a servant. You're living in a fence from past church experiences. And the whole reason that you're just attending and you're not serving is because you, you're just dealing with all this offense from churches past and leaders past. Well, man, they weren't representing Jesus. It's time we need to let go of that offense. Some of us in here, you're walking in passivity. You, passivity is knowing the things that you ought to do and don't. Proverbs calls it a sin. 
we got to start a love revolution. Where does it start? Look in the mirror. The love revolution, the wild, crazy love revolution that we're believing for, that souls and souls, what we're believing for a stadium to be filled, nations to be touched, homes to be saved. Where does it start? You choosing to love. And I hope that this catalyzes you into something. I hope this catalyzes you into wild love. And so we as a church need to make a commitment this morning. I, we honestly, we could have a service and we could all just pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, pray the fire of God to be amazing, but we need to be grieved by our sin. It's a sin that we don't love. It's a sin that we don't serve. God is asking you, will you serve? Will you lay down your life for your friend? That's what I did for you. Come on, Valley Church. Will you commit to loving without limits? Jesus introduces this new word explaining love and he calls it agape. It means unconditional. It's time we got to let go of our conditional love and say, I'm taking on the way of Christ and saying, I'm going to live unconditionally. No matter the cost, no matter who, no matter what they look like, no matter what religion they believe in, I'm going to love them because it's what Jesus did. How did they flip the world upside down? How did God use uneducated, ordinary men? They were radical lovers. And so here's my call this morning. Some of us need to get free from some offense. Maybe you're offended towards a pastor. Maybe you're offended towards a friend. But it's hindering you from being the love revolution that you're created to be. We need to be the change. We're praying, God, do it. We're interceding. I'm a firm believer in intercession, but I'm also a firm believer that you can be the answers to your own prayers. We've been pressing him for so long. God, would you send missionaries? Would you send laborers to the harvest field? Have you asked yourself, what about me? God, I, I just changed my boss, like for goodness sake. Change my wife. Be the answer. Let go of your offense. Maybe you found yourself avoiding people. Like there's always that one person and it's like you see them and you just walk the other way. That's offense. That's hindering you from being love. When you have offense, it leads to a lack of trust. And when you have a lack of trust, you have a lack of vulnerability. We need to be vulnerable again. You need to humble yourself and say, you know what? I don't have it all together. You know what? There, there is more that I can do. There is more that I can do. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. We need to be grieved with our sin. Because it's godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. It's when we actually come to the realization, you know what? I've fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm telling you, man, we cannot afford to fall short of the glory of God. I'm ready to see his glory fill churches again. I'm ready. I'm ready to see his glory. I'm ready to see the cloud by day and the fire by night. I'm ready to see what Moses saw when he cried out, Lord, show me your glory. And for 40 days he didn't eat because he was so enraptured by the beauty and glory of God. What Isaiah saw in chapter 6, at the train of his robe filled the temple. He was high and lifted up. I don't want a new church anymore. I want a love revolution. That's the cry of a generation. That's the cry of our generation. Who will love? Is it you? And so here's my ask. No hype in this moment. I'm going to do this first the beauty of the gospel is Jesus came to show us love so that we can become love. He came to take away the sins of the world. He came to make you like him. He came to restore you back to relationship. And so I'm going to throw this out there. And as I'm speaking, you're being convicted of your sin. And you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. I'm telling you this is real. Six years, seven years ago, I was a drug addict. 
I was falling from the Lord. I had no regard for him in my life. But as soon as I gave my life to him, my life didn't get easy, but I had a hope. I had a future and it was in him. And God wants to give that to you. So with every eye closed right now, if that's you, if you were just saying like, man, I need to, maybe I just need to rededicate my life to the Lord. I need to get right with Jesus. Like I need to surrender everything. I need to surrender over to his Lordship. I want you to raise your hand right now. First time, I'm gonna count to three, okay? If you need to give your life to him, you've never given your life to Jesus. I'm gonna count to three. I want you to raise your hand. Ready, one, two, three. Is that you? Is that you? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I want you to pray this, everyone with me. Just say, Jesus, I repent. I repent of my sin. Would you wash me white as snow? I believe that you're the Son of God, Jesus. I believe that you came to the earth. You lived a perfect life. And you died a death you didn't deserve. And that you rose on the third day to give me resurrection life. And so right now, in Jesus' name, I receive resurrection life. Holy Spirit, Come and baptize me in your power now in Jesus' name. Come on, can we lift up a shout to Jesus? And here's, here's going to be my last call. And I don't know if we have any, any announcements, but I just feel like we're just supposed to just lay this here. To give people, if you feel like you want to go, you're able to go. But if you want to linger in the presence of the Lord, here's my call to you. If you feel like you need to get rid of offense, uh, you, you, like God's bringing up someone that you've just been really offended to. Something happens. Not, there's nothing special about this place, but there's something special about an altar. It's where things die. And you're coming up to the altar as a sign saying, I'm letting go of my offense. I'm calling it for what it is. It's sin. I'm repenting. And God, I thank you that you're replacing it with an unoffendable heart. That I will live free from offense. Because I'm so free from me that I'm free from what anyone could ever think. If that's you, I want you to meet me up here. If you've been carrying offense, second thing, if you've been walking in passivity, you've been, you've been lacking initiation when it comes to living the lifestyle of love and a radical servanthood, I want you to meet me up here too, okay? I'm gonna count to three. We're gonna lead into some worship. And I want you to have a moment with the Lord. I don't feel the need to lay hands on you. You don't need me to lay hands on you. You need Jesus. He's the only one that washes away the sins of the world. So if that's you, I'm gonna count, people are already coming, but if I'm just gonna count to three, if that's you, we're gonna end the service, you can go, but if you wanna to respond to that, I'm gonna to count to three, I want you to just come up here, ready? One, two, three, meet me up here right now, if that's you. If you wanna let go of offense, you wanna let go of passivity, you just come up here right now. And have a moment with the Lord. Have a moment with Jesus. Just repent of your sin, it's easy. Repentance is joyful. We get to look like him. So just have a moment with the Lord right here. No one's going to lay hands on you. No one's going to touch you. You just have a moment with the Lord and his glory is just going to come upon you.